As you may know, electricity is the flow of free electrons between atoms. We use copper wires because copper has a lot of free electrons, which makes it very easy to pass electricity through. We use rubber to insulate the copper wires and keep us safe, because rubber is an insulator, which means its electrons are held very tightly and they can't therefore move between other atoms. If we look at the basic model of an atom for a metal conductor, we have the nucleus at the centre, and this is surrounded by a number of orbital shells which hold the electrons. Each shell holds a maximum number of electrons, and an electron has to have a certain amount of energy to be accepted into each shell. The electrons located farthest away from the nucleus hold the most energy. The outermost shell is known as the valence shell, and a conductor has between 1 and 3 electrons in its valence shell. The electrons are held in place by the nucleus, but there's another shell known as the conduction band. If an electron can reach this, then it can break free from the atom and move to another. With a metal atom such as copper, the conduction band and the valence shell overlap, so it's very easy for the electron to move. With an insulator, the outermost shell is packed. There's very little to no room for an electron to join. The nucleus has a tight grip on the electrons and the conduction band is far away, so the electrons can't reach this to escape. Therefore, electricity cannot flow through this material. However, there's another material known as a semiconductor. Silicon is an example of a semiconductor. With this material, there's one too many electrons in the outermost shell for it to be a conductor, so it acts as an insulator. But as the conduction band is quite close, if we provide some external energy, some electrons will gain enough energy to make the jump from the valence and into the conduction band to become free. Therefore, this material can act as both an insulator and a conductor. Pure silicon has almost no free electrons. So what engineers do is dope the silicon with a small amount of another material to change the electrical properties. We call this p-type and n-type doping. We combine these doped materials to form the diode. So inside the diode, we have the two leads, the anode and the cathode, which connect to some thin plates. And then between these plates, there is a layer of p-type doped silicon on the anode side and the layer of n-type doped silicon on the cathode side. The whole thing is enclosed in a resin to insulate and protect the materials. Let's imagine the material hasn't been doped yet, so it's just pure silicon inside. Each silicon atom is surrounded by four other silicon atoms. Each atom wants eight electrons in its valence shell, but the silicon atoms only have four electrons in their valence shell, so they sneakily share an electron with their neighboring atom to get the eight they desire. This is known as covalent bonding. When we add in the n-type material such as phosphorus, it will take the position of some of the silicon atoms. The phosphorus atom has five electrons in its valence shell. So as the silicon atoms are sharing electrons to get their desired eight, they don't need this extra one. So there's now extra electrons in the material and these are therefore free to move. With p-type doping, we add in a material such as aluminium or aluminum. This atom has only three electrons in its valence shell so it can't provide its four neighbours with an electron to share, so one of them will have to go without. There is therefore a hole created where an electron can sit and occupy. So we now have two doped pieces of silicon, one with too many electrons and one with not enough electrons. The two materials join to form a p-n junction. At this junction, we get what's known as a depletion region. In this region, some of the excess electrons from the n-type side will move over to occupy the holes in the p-type side. This migration will form a barrier with a buildup of electrons and holes on opposite sides. The electrons are negatively charged and the holes are considered therefore positively charged. So the buildup causes a slightly negatively charged region and a slightly positively charged region. This creates an electric field and prevents more electrons from moving across. The potential difference across this region is about 0.7 volts in typical diodes. When we connect a voltage source across the diode, with the anode, the p-type, connected to the positive and the cathode, n-type, connected to the negative, this will create a forward bias and allow the current to flow. The voltage source has to be greater than the 0.7 volt barrier, otherwise the electrons can't make the jump. When we reverse the power supply so that the positive is connected to the n-type cathode and the negative is connected to the p-type anode, the holes are pulled towards the negative and the electrons are pulled towards the positive and this causes the barrier to expand. Therefore, the diode acts as an insulator to prevent the flow of current. Okay, that's it for this video, but to continue your learning, then check out one of the videos on screen now, and I'll catch you there for the next lesson.
Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, as well as theengineeringmindset.com.